Uh, welcome, everyone. I am Saksham from Forum for the Future, but more importantly, I lead the Responsible Energy Initiative, and that's what I'm here to represent. Uh, a huge welcome to everyone who's here in person, who's joining us online. Uh, I think hybrid events are the are the future to go, and we're experimenting with it. Uh, just in case for people who are joining online, um, if there are any IT difficulties, please bear with us. Uh, we're still getting all the hybrid systems um, smooth, running smoothly. Um, it's going to be a short event and a short and a crisp one, but one uh, which is going to be quite important for the renewable energy sector. Um, we are very delighted to have some really influential and some really knowledgeable people join us today uh, over the next hour and a half as well. Um, we're going to have um, a few keynote speech speeches uh, from the dignitaries here. Who you, you'll hear uh, from them in a bit. And then we're going to have a CEO's roundtable um, where we're going to discuss what action, what responsible action might also look like. Um, before I invite uh, Mr. Shankar to give the welcome address, I do want to point out that you know this is a pivotal moment for us in the industry, in the RE sector. All of us want uh, renewable energy to scale rapidly. All of us want a secure, low carbon future. Um, all of us are looking at India to take the leadership in deploying renewable energy as well. Um, but we also know that this is an opportunity to set norms in a way that renewable energy can become a benchmark sector for everyone else to look up to as well. Um, it can also help position India in being leaders in terms of the value that renewable energy can create um, including and going beyond decarbonization as well. This is, we think it's only a beginning for us and for the renewable energy sector, uh, because this really is a moment where we can go uh, two ways in terms of responsibility and accountability and transparency. And we hope to really see a much more um, responsible, transparent and accountable renewable energy sector come up and set a benchmark for other sectors to follow as well. On behalf of the Responsible Energy Initiative, I welcome the speakers, the participants, um, audience for sitting in person and online. Um, before I hand over to Mr. Shankar for the address, for those of you who are sitting here, uh, I don't think there's a fire drill planned. So if there are any buzzers, we run out and follow um, the fire precautions. Um, and please do keep your mobile phones on silent. Um, feel free to take photographs. Um, uh, but, you know, we would love if the mobile phones are on silent, you can take your calls outside. Um, there will be a moment for question and answers for those of you online and for those of you who are in person as well towards the end. Um, and we'll make sure we give that opportunity too. So uh, please bear with us. And I hope um, you are able to learn from this event and get inspired as well. Um, I would like to invite Mr. Shankar to um, give um, the welcome note. Uh, Mr. Shankar, well, for most of you, he needs no introduction. Um, he has donned many hats. Um, he's had an illustrious and rich career in public services for over 45 years, primarily in the fields of industry, power, and urban development. He joined uh, the IS in 1973 and retired in 2009 as the Secretary, Department of Industrial Policy and Promotion. Uh, Mr. Shankar continues to work with various organizations as advisors, uh, as, a, as an advisor, as a board member, and even as the president of various organizations. Mr. Shankar, we are honored to have you here, and I'd like to invite you here for a welcome note. Uh, let me begin by thanking the Responsible Energy Initiative for giving me the privilege of being here. And also to thank you for getting me to think of it. <laughs> uh, my friend Ajay Mathur, Shirish God, uh, others in the audience, and those who are listening online. So, so uh, let me begin by making a bit of a confession. I'm, I'm a bit old now, I should say, because you know, we're no longer young. So the phrase just transition when I face, first came across it, I thought this is something new. I don't know what it means. Why is the phrase there? And then I realized that a lot of thinking had gone into the evolution of this phrase. 
And then I began correlating it to all that I had seen before I discovered the phrase. So, so those of us uh, who are familiar with North India, there is a city of Kanpur, of which I was the divisional commissioner once upon a time. And a hundred years back, it was a globally competitive center of the textile industry. About 90,000 workers would go out when the morning gong rang for the textile mills. And there were global brand names. It was truly competitive in terms of cost and quality. Then began the slow process of various changes in India and across the world. And Kanpur from being the fifth largest industrial city of India to the 60s was a city in decline and uh, despair by the time I was there. All the mills were closed. They looked like abandoned you know, cities or parts of a past which was remote or whose days had gone. Then I had the privilege of going overseas and then I saw so many cities in England and US which are great thriving centers of industrial activity, of traditional industries, and many due to globalization and shifting of manufacturing from Europe and the US to China had become ghost towns. And then I found that many of them, after struggling through despair, tried to figure out how to recreate themselves. So, so uh, when I was in school, there was this phrase carrying coal to Newcastle. So I happened to visit Newcastle a few years back, and I found that they had made a huge effort to re-engineer themselves as a startup hub, as a you know people trying to position themselves for the new economy. So then, and then I also had the privilege of going to Wales and seeing the old towns where coal mining used to take place. And they were again communities in great despair and really suffered because coal mining ended in UK with a bang. So I thought those who thought through these things and came up with the phrase just transition, I think we're doing a great service to our generation because the biggest transition that is going to happen now, I hope it happens very quickly, but it has, it has begun to happen. So the question is whether we'll do enough in time. But it's a transition of moving away completely from fossil fuels. So a zero fossil fuel world is what we need. And we need it as of yesterday, I believe. But even if we don't get it by yesterday, the sooner we get it, the better it is. And I believe the, the, the stage has reached where I think it's pointless getting into these I mean, I wouldn't say irrelevant debates, but debates which have been very passionate about who did what, when, who has put out how much CO2 in the environment, et cetera, et cetera. Now it's a question of survival of all of us together or all of us going down. So I think that debate is not very useful or uh, productive. But leaving that aside, the key question is that this is going to be an epochal transformation. And how do we do it right? How do we get all stakeholders to feel that it is win-win for all of them? How do we make it happen very quickly? Now, the fossil fuel industry anywhere in the world today is a very large industry. It has enormous economic heft. It employs lots of people. It has deep pockets. It also is, in some ways, a rational player in the economic marketplace. What do rational players do? You protect yourself. You defend yourself. So the last two, three decades, those who've been wanting faster action on climate change have been very often, you know, scuttled or so on and so forth, but very smart PR and all kinds of other lobbying from the fossil fuel industry, some conscious, some subconscious. And the best example is the United States, where the one leading party is still not convinced that it needs to act and act very urgently. And the United States is still a global leader. And when they don't act, lots of people in other parts of the world feel we need not act. And then you get very clever ideas that carbon capture and storage is around the corner. So let's wait for a few years. Once that's a reality, the fossil fuel industry can survive forever. But, but coming to our situation and our context, I think it makes good sense for us to start thinking, engaging all stakeholders and creating a lively discussion, debate, and consensus 
on what is the best way to go forward. Because there are two things which will happen and must happen in India very fast. One is the rapid scaling up of renewables and achieving the 2030 COP26 goals of 500 GW of non-fossil fuel electricity capacity. That's a huge challenge. Uh, many are very skeptical, but I'm one of those optimistic people who believe that this can be achieved with difficulty, but we can do it. Now, related to that is the challenge which will emerge as we go on, because whether we like it or not, coal usage has to peak, and then it has to decline and go to zero. Whether we like it or not, petrol, diesel, gas usage has to peak and decline and go to zero. It has to happen as soon as possible in the interest of mankind, but Within India, it will be a big debate on how to do it, when to do it, what the cost benefits are. But in this uh, debate on handling it in a art, this transition in a way where everybody sees it as a win-win situation, a lot of discussion is required on who are the likely winners, who are the losers, how do we handle the losers, how do we give them opportunities to re-engineer themselves, redevelop themselves, so that they do not see them as losers or are not real losers. Now that's a creative task, not easy. I mean, if somebody would ask me to give solutions today, I'd say I have none. But I think if all of us begin talking about it ahead of the curves, a few in advance, I think we could have something reasonably sensible in place on which there is a broad measure of agreement. And going by the experience of the advanced economy is getting the energy companies to come around and re-engineer themselves as renewable energy companies and shed the energy bit of their history into the dustbin is not going to be easy. But I think we need to make them partners in the transition because they must see their future in renewable energy and they must also see that they can only survive if they succeed in the renewable energy world. And I'm very glad when our largest private energy company, Reliance, announced very ambitious plans of what they would achieve by 2030. I think that's the way forward for all our fossil fuel energy companies, rather than you know, getting into debate today that whether I can make convert coal into gas or I can get hydrogen out of gas, we can do it as an interim. But ultimately, we have to liberate ourselves from fossil fuels. And it's a tough task. And this fair transition also is a tough task. And I'm so glad that this event is being organized, and I think India may hopefully be ahead of the curve in doing this just right and just well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shankar. Uh, very insightful, uh, and thank you for even sharing the history um, of how you know our journey on energy transitions and where we need to go from here. Um, I would now like to invite Dr. Mathur for the keynote speech. Um, Dr. Mathur needs no introduction yet um, if you need a refresher um, he heads the international solar alliance and was also the member of prime minister's council on climate change um, he has a wealth of leadership and expertise across energy transition areas from policy research technology to finance international cooperation and institutional development as well um, dr mathur we at responsible energy are fortunate to welcome you and have your guidance as well he, along with Gavin McGivildry at FCDO India, um, sorry, launched our call to action report in March 2021. And we are glad to share that 26 organizations addressed that call to action and have collectively set an ambitious vision for a responsible renewable energy system. Um, Dr. Mathura, I welcome you to share your perspective on the opportunity that the RE sector has to set a benchmark. Thanks. Thank you, Saksham. Thank you very much. Uh, Shri Ajay Shankar, <coughs> Shri Garur, Anna, uh, friends of many, many years. I, I think I know most of you quite well, but uh, I look forward to making new friends as well. First of all, it's a moment of immense pleasure for me uh, because Terry and Forum for the Future uh, built on the work that and I had the good fortune to contribute to it along with other colleagues in Terry uh, from Lendesa, from WRI, WWF, and so on. And the research for this report clearly brought out that even though renewable energy is seeing is seen as a, a great example, a quintessential example uh, of sustainability and green growth. 
there are a complex mix of factors and you know these factors include energy equity they include participatory governance they include uh, the livelihoods of people who are based where these systems would be cited they include uh, uh, ensuring the full life cycle uh, di discussion of the uh, of the entire re system is safe and secure all of these things are important as we move to the future we cannot move to a future which is exactly the same as was the case with fossil fuels. I think we have the chance to re-engineer the future. Now, these all these issues, it turned out, are intertwined to a great degree and have yet to receive the amount of attention that they deserve. Now, let me build on what Mr. Ajay Shankar had spoken about. It is important, first of all, to socialize the fact that we can have a governance structure which is different from the one that we have now. This doesn't mean that the ownership changes, no. But it does mean a greater degree of participation by various other communities so that the issues of equity, the issues of participatory governance, the issue of community involvement, the issue of life cycle management, all are addressed in this. Now, having said this, I think one of the things that we are realizing at the, as the International Solar Alliance is that as you move from country to country, history matters. Let me give you a very sh small example. It's an example which which exemplifies the kinds of differences that occur in policy and legal uh, 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 frameworks across countries. And this has to do with how companies are managed. In Germany, for example, you have a two level structure. One level, which is much more about the daily operations, includes workers, includes the management and therefore is about ensuring that the returns on the uh, uh, on whatever you do are maximized at the same time keeping in view the workers interests but above this is a larger management which includes not only the company's representatives not necessarily the financial representatives, but the company's representatives. It includes the city where you are based. It includes, for example, sometimes the state's representatives in the state that you are based. This is a very different kind of legal organization than you would have, for example, in this country where the Companies Act looks at a board of directors, which is drawn largely from people who have invested in the company. We have over the years <clears throat> ensured that there are independent directors to ensure that this does not go uh, all one way. We have over the years ensured a set of compliances and consequently the kinds of interventions you would do in India would be very different from the interventions you would do in Germany, would be very different from the interventions that you do in the US where for example you have the A list of uh, investors who have special rights as far as the uh, the uh, as far as the uh, structure of the company and changes to the structure of the company are concerned the short point i'd like to leave you with is that the next step beyond the socialization of these ideas is getting into the details of how from country to country we will move on these principles that we are talking about. I will focus on one more issue, and that has to do with mechanisms both for ensuring that global supply chains exist and that global end of life treatment exists. One of the things I think we have learned the hard way is that we cannot, number one, dump, for example, coal ash in landfills. 
doesn't work. Similarly, we cannot look at a future where we dump PV panels and batteries in landfills. That's not the future. Similarly, having long supply chains, uh, you know, at this moment they're all, while there is a little bit of uh, plurality, but most of them are from one country. This becomes very difficult as the recent pandemic and after that, the supply chain crisis regarding the ocean tankers has shown us this is unviable. This leads to a lot of questions. What is the kind of global structure that makes sense, economic sense and environmental sense as we go ahead? Let me give you an example. If we are looking at recycling as much of the solar panels and batteries as possible, then you need to design it so that during recycling, the materials can be taken apart. They have to be designed to be dismantleable. How does this happen? They will, we will need standards which allow for this to occur. Do these standards exist? No, they don't. But we we'll need to work in that direction. Similarly, on the supply side, if you look at the economics of production, probably polysilicon would be made in four or five places in the world. But, and they, they possibly ingots will probably be made there, ingots or polysilicon. But cells could be made in maybe 20, 30 countries around the world. Modules could be made all in almost every region and almost every country. In other words, we, depending on the economics of the production and of demand, we will see a geographical distribution. I mean, remember, not that long ago, we had the same kind of issue as far as the steel production was concerned. We, we did have steel plants in a few locations, but slowly they grew across the world. Can we learn from that? Can we learn how geographical dispersion of production occurs? One of the problems that occurred with the steel industry and is occurring with the renewables industry is that when you set up a new plant, it costs more than existing production. And consequently, every country in the world which promotes production has some kinds of incentives. The US has the uh, tax incentives, whatever they call credit, tax credit incentives. India has the PLI, the production linked incentive. The EU has direct incentives. In other words, for a period of time, you need to cross this hump. Is there any discussion around these instruments? Again, according to history, how would they work? Is there a discussion on which are more effective? I think these are important. The short point is that we have embarked on a great journey. I think we will socialize the kinds of uh, issues that have arisen out of this report. I think the next step is to develop the roadmaps. And my suggestion is country specific roadmaps or at least region specific roadmaps as we move ahead. I'm absolutely delighted to see the group of people gathered here today. This is essential for making change happen. Thank you all very, very much. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Mathur, for sharing your thoughts. Um, we completely agree the opportunity that the renewable energy sector has here, and, and I think there's a lot of inspiration and guidance um, they can see, seek from your speech. Um, I would like to request you and Mr. Shankar to officially launch the vision. Um, you will see a folder in front of you with a ribbon tied uh, on the vision document. If you can untie it, we'll have the team here read out the vision and principles after this as well. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Shankar, Dr. Mathur. Um, we, we are very grateful for your time um, as well. Um, I would um, like to request Shirish uh, to present um, Dr. Mathur and Mr. Shankar with a token of appreciation.
Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Mato, Mr. Shankar, we are quite delighted to have your guidance and consistent guidance and championing the cause for uh, responsible renewable energy development. Um, thank you very much. Um, I'd uh, I would now like to invite the team from the Responsible Energy Initiative to share the ambitious vision and principles that we've got um, as well. Um, following, following the sharing of the vision and principles, we'll have a really insightful panel discussion between uh, some of the leading CEOs and managing directors of renewable companies and investment firms to really explore what action looks like. So please be with us uh, for the next hour or so too. Hansika, um, Rashmi, Manali, Apurva, if I can invite you here. Um, yeah, you can you can have the video too. That was a quick short video of the vision and principle that we just launched. Um, and thank you so much for your very insightful remarks, Dr. Mathur and Mr. Shankar. Um, uh, hello, everyone. I'm Hansika from Forum for the Future, and I'll be joined by, by my colleagues uh, Manali from Forum, Rashmi from Terry, and Apurva from WWF India uh, to present the vision and principles uh, that we just launched. Um, as actors in a responsible energy system, we embrace the power of nature to create, renew, and restore. We understand that humans are a fundamental part of nature, hence we must uh, ensure we operate in harmony and within planetary boundaries across our value chains. We believe that being responsible means respecting the human rights and dignity of all, holding to principles of justice and equity, and supporting people to thrive. We drive a just energy transition in a way that enables deep positive transformation, enabling flourishing and resilient communities and society. Our work is inclusive, rights respecting, and participatory, and aims to center dignity and well being of individuals and communities at every step. The way we work inherently tackles the climate emergency and the biodiversity crisis as we have reconfigured from extractive to restorative and circular systems. We enable the capacity of social, institutional, and environmental systems to adapt to future challenges and opportunities. We are collaborative, passionate, confident, and transparent, and respect the rich and diverse cultures we are part of. We ensure fairness, resilience, and vitality across generations and geographies. As a sector, we see our scope of responsibility and our potential for positive influence goes beyond our direct operations. We look beyond profit and growth in our definition of value, seeking to leave a holistic positive legacy. I'd like to invite Manali to take us through the first principle. Thank you, Hansika. Um, I'm pleased to be here and share our first principle by which we actively promote universal labor, land and human rights. Um, we respect, uphold, and promote the human rights of individuals and communities who are impacted by decisions across the renewable energy value chain. Importantly, this means aligning to the UN guiding principles on business and human rights across the renewable energy value chain. We will enhance the renewable energy sector's transformative potential to tackle the root causes of injustice and structural inequality extant in the current energy system by building a system based upon climate justice and energy equity. We commit to avoiding activities that may contribute to or cause human rights infringements. 
where possible and appropriate, we will enable access to remedy where there is evidence of infringements. Thanks. I would now like to hand over to Apurva from WWF to share principle two. Thank you, Manali. It is my pleasure to read the next principle. Uh, Uh, so, as part of this, we protect, restore, and nurture resilient, thriving ecological systems. We recognize that the source of renewable energy is nature itself, and thus recognize that we are dependent on its health. Throughout the value chain, we conserve and restore ecological systems and biodiversity. We have deep capability in understanding and assessing impacts and potential consequences holistically and over time. We embrace innovations and business models that recognize the value of ecosystem services and encourage other sectors to do the same. Thank you. I welcome Rashmi to the next two. Uh, good morning. I'll share principles three and four. Uh, we are committed to participatory governance principles. With ethics and integrity, we embrace and practice the principles of participatory governance. We commit to have open, accountable, and inclusive engagements with the communities we work with and consider the principle of free, prior, and informed consent to be a bare minimum where indigenous peoples are affected. We will intentionally create the means by which women, local peoples, youth, as well as marginalized communities can participate in collaborative decision making where our operations and choices, current and future, affect them and their communities. We believe that resilient communities and an inclusive workforce are key to our success. We create opportunities for everyone, particularly marginalized groups, and take action that addresses power and access imbalances. Our intention is to actively break through the patterns of exclusion and create a culture of sharing to enable a truly fair and inclusive renewable energy system. We steward a just transition by building adaptive capacity in communities and our workforce, creating avenues for sustainable livelihoods and ensuring value is fairly distributed across our value chains and stakeholders. Back to you, Hansika. Thank you so much, Manali, Apurva and Rashmi. Um, we are happy to bring together the 26 pioneering organizations um, that you can we project the slide? Yes, thank you. That you see on the slide um, and the support from many, many experts and individuals who have helped us bring the nuances and ambitions uh, to, to this initiative. I would like to reiterate that this is just the first step. Um, as Dr. Mathur rightly pointed out, that the real work begins as you deal with these principles and vision as you take the work from country to country. Um, in the coming months, we'll be exploring what action looks like with each of these participants and how can we uh, use these visions and principles as the guide rail to push our ambition. Um, you can download the vision document through this QR code. It is also on your tables. Uh, we encourage every audience member to share this with your colleagues and senior leadership. Um, and with that, I would now like to invite Anna Biswas and Radha Krishnan to come up for the roundtable discussion. Thank you so much. Um, while, uh, thank you, Hansika, Rashmi, Manali, and Apurva. While uh, the panelists are getting seated here in the room, um, can I request the panelists online to make sure your video is on, you are unmuted uh, and ready to have the discussion with us? Um, Satish, Vivek, um, Ritu, Narayan, if you want to make sure your videos are on, you're unmuted. Uh, we're just making sure that everyone can see you on the screen here and everyone can see you on the screen uh, online as well. Great, we're all mic'd up. Um, Narayan, if you can hear me, uh, great. We've got your video as well. I believe Ritu is joining shortly, um, and and I think we can start with the panel, Anna. Over to you. All right. Can you guys hear me OK? Yep. yep. Excellent. Yep. Yep. All right. Um, so I am incredibly privileged yep. uh, to be joined by 
four and soon to be five esteemed colleagues who have been working for some time on looking at what it will take to really action this vision. You know, words are a beautiful thing, intent is important, but really when it comes down to it, given the urgency of the situation, it's the action that we're looking at. We know that there are numerous things that we need to do and numerous challenges facing us in this journey. Uh, and I am incredibly pleased to be joined by Radhakrishnan. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> by Narayan P.S., by Satish and by Vivek and soon hopefully by Ritu. It's very early for her in the UK, so it may be, it may be just a time issue. Yeah. Um, I'll ask them each to introduce themselves shortly uh, and just to explain how they've been involved in the Responsible Energy Initiative as part of their organizations. Um, Brother Christian, can I invite you to do so first? Thanks, thanks Anna. Uh, it's a great privilege to be part of this panel uh, because uh, I represent a company called Axion Energy and the managing director of the company in India. Uh, we are a sustainable company and we have been ranked number one by S&P Global when it comes to sustainability. As Mr. Mathur was explaining, we are number one in sustainability in Spain and in other countries. So we wanted to be more specific, more country specific and more region specific. Hopefully we'll be able to be part of this initiative and we'll be able to produce a responsible renewable energy. Thanks. Uh, Satish, can I invite you to introduce yourself? Thanks. Uh, I'm, I'm Satish Mandana. Uh, I'm the chief investment officer of uh, Eversource Capital. Uh, we are India's climate focus fund and uh, in our portfolio, we have two renewable energy companies. Uh, one is IANA, which is currently 4 gigawatt, uh, supplying energy to CK Discoms, uh, NTPC. The second is Radiance Renewable, uh, which supplies renewable energy solutions to corporate sector, commercial, institutional and industrial sectors. Uh, that has been uh, our current contribution in respect to renewable energy production, but we have other portfolio companies which uses renewable energy, uh, including in the e-mobility business. Thanks. Thank you, Satish. That's brilliant. Uh, Narayan P.S., <coughs> could I invite you? Good morning. My name is P.S. Narayan. Um, it's a real privilege to be part of this, uh, what I would think is uh, quite a radical uh, initiative that is being launched. Uh, I lead uh, Wipro's Sustainability and Social Initiatives Program globally. And um, in summary, we have a climate change program that goes back 15 years. And uh, we've been constantly trying to raise the bar in terms of our ambitions, as well as in terms of what we could do, not only on E, but on S and G. And uh, that's one of the reasons why we've been involved with the Forum for the Future and the others as part of this initiative right from the beginning. Thank you very much. Thank you, Narayan. And Vivek, in your wonderfully branded T-shirt, please may I <laughs> invite you to introduce yourself. Thanks for spotting that. My marketing team has done its job and they're very happy there. <laughs> Thank you for uh, having us here as well. Um, I'm the co-founder uh, of Fourth Partner Energy. Uh, Fourth Partner Energy was set up about 12 years back. And uh, for uh, in the decade that has been, we have only focused on supplying renewable energy to corporates. That's what we do. Um, we have as our uh, customer base um, some of the leading uh, corporates across India, uh, and in our um, from our financing pool, we've um, you know we have apart from TPG and Nord Fund, uh, we also have plenty of Indian ESG financiers, Indian and international ESG financiers. We are learning a lot from all the financiers as well as our customers on uh, on how uh, this platform can get. Uh, more responsible uh, and not just be a provider of renewable energy and looking forward to to working with all of you all on this front. Thank you. Thank you. So yeah, real privilege to be joined by you all. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, my job is to try and uh, extract the insights from our four uh, eminent esteemed colleagues here on how we can put this vision into action. So. I'm going to pose the first question to you, Satish. Um, it's a big one, <laughs> so no pressure. Um, but as we've heard from our earlier speakers, you know, we have the chance to reimagine how the energy system here can work. Uh, move from 
extractive to more regenerative and circular ways of, uh, of thinking and doing. He talked about governance, uh, life cycle management, uh, waste management standards, country specific uh, uh, roadmaps. I guess from your perspective as a, you know, as someone who funds both the renewable energy developers and the people that use the energy themselves, what do you think really needs to be done to get to this vision of a responsible energy system? Uh, thanks uh, for that question. Uh, not that difficult. Uh, <laughs> so if I had to summarize one in one word, uh, the answer will be circularity uh, and sustainability, basically. So any organization, uh, as rightly pointed out in this principle, I can have a sustained growth or survival uh, if we are taking uh, due care of the environment, which we are dependent upon for our own renewable sources and the community to which we are serving over there. So, so long as we are able to create circular systems, uh, and I can give a few examples from our portfolio companies to substantiate this. Uh, let's talk about IANA. When we started our first plant in Andhra Pradesh, uh, before even the plant commenced, uh, we organized a training school for the women uh, in the neighborhood to train them how to help in assembling panels and putting it together. And when the actual plant started construction, we deployed those women uh, to really be the part of the workforce over there. Uh, take the case of uh, a secular example in our waste management, uh, where in indoor city, we collect the waste, wet waste and convert into the renewable natural gas, uh, which gets supplied back to the municipal corporations buses uh, and the fertilizer gets supplied to the horticulture department of the municipal corporation and beyond kind of a thing. Now, Dr. Ajay specifically pointed out the need for regulatory framework, whereby the responsibility for the end of the life uses is fixed and is being monitored and is being accounted for in the books of accounts. So that's the gap at this juncture, barring a kind of a solar panel which we use, which has got Cadmium Telluride, uh, and that company by law internationally per force has to take the obligation of taking the responsibility of end of life, safe disposal. But in general, there's no regulatory framework at this juncture to talk about how do we really safely dispose of a normal silicon uh, or any other Ziggs material panel at this juncture. So I think it's a food for thought and for all of us that we need to bring this whole circularity. We cannot be using earth and the environment as a dumping ground. At each stage of our production of components or the equipment, we keep rejecting and we keep having that waste really spoiling and changing the environment. So, so long as we are conscious around it, I think we should be able to achieve that circularity. Brilliant. Thank you, Satish. Um, so, Thank you. We've heard about circularity, ensuring that we're tackling some of the inequity in society by engaging women in uh, sustainable livelihoods, re necessary regulatory frameworks. That's really helpful. Um, Narayan, can I come to you uh, and just kind of look at the other side of the coin? Because, you know, we've been looking at this now for a year together, and I know that many challenges have been voiced uh, in terms of making some of what Satish has just asked for possible. I wonder what, in your opinion, what the really practical challenges in implementing responsible renewable energy are and any thoughts you've had in terms of your learning on how to overcome them? Sure. Uh, I think uh, corporations, you know, uh, so far, um, they've had, they, they have three streams running, uh, not necessarily, uh, you know, in consonance or in tandem. One is, of course, a climate change program, and, and many many corporations have committed to net zero targets, uh, including us. So that's one, and that's a fairly mature program in uh, many companies in terms of uh, the how and the what. Then there is a business and human rights program, which is relatively recent. Uh, there are requirements from a, a regulatory perspective, SEBI's BRSR uh, requirements, uh, which kick in this year. Uh, require companies to disclose and to do a lot on business and human rights. Uh, and then, you know, the third is uh, what companies do with communities as part of CSR. Uh, 
if I look at uh, the vision and principles of uh, responsible energy, uh, you know, all the three need to really come together. And uh, which is why I said, you know, uh, while E is probably very strong, uh, but S uh, has to conjoin uh, with uh, the procurement of renewable energy. And uh, underlying that has to be, therefore, a strengthening of the governance processes within the company. That could mean many things. That could mean, for example, how do you uh, change your procurement policies now so that when you're looking at procurement of renewable energy, you incorporate some of these principles. Right. The practical challenges are going to be this, that, you know, it's uh, one matter for customers to demand a lot of this, but it's also, you know, uh, uh, it's going to take some time for suppliers to, uh, uh, to to come up to speed on some of these very demanding requirements. I mean, we must be cognizant of the fact that uh, businesses do certain things well, but certain things we are, we are in a starting phase. Some companies are a little more ahead than others. For example, when it comes to human rights in the supply chain, uh, some sectors are more advanced than the others, but it's not a uniform story, right? So uh, it's going to take joint collaborative efforts between the different between all the players to uh, move in the direction of stronger human rights and community resilience and the other principles that uh, you know this initiative talks about. Um, it has to work both ways. I think companies can play a big role by catalyzing this, by incorporating this as part of their procurement policies. Uh, what it will require, though, is operationalizing these principles into some kind of uh, uh, not standard op operating procedures, but something which can be, uh, you know, uh, understood and implemented by the uh, functions in a corporation, right? So we'll come to that later, but uh, that's that's probably broadly the uh, some of the challenges that I see immediately ahead. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Narayan. Um, I'm interested. I'm going to come to you, Vivek, because I'm interested in uh, how the investor investee relationship might help overcome some of the same challenges that Narayan was 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 pointing towards. There is an interesting dynamic between the buyers of renewable energy and the developers themselves. So, you know, how does that relationship help encourage? But there's also that interesting dynamic between what the investor wants and what oh. the investee wants. And I'm just interested in your experience. Unfortunately, Ritu's not here, but as an investor of yours, you know, I know that you're actively working together on looking at how the responsible, how your renewable energy can be more responsible. So how, in your experience, what is it that investors and investees can do together to make this happen? Sure, no, thanks. Um, I think a uh, very strong role uh, that needs to work in conjunction. I think if you take a step back and, uh, and assess where we operate, um, and, and this is a strange statement probably that I'm going to make, but the government's role um, in ensuring uh, a, a responsible renewable energy rollout uh, is is quite minimal as it stands today, uh, and and uh, to that extent, uh, you know, for example, we don't need to submit uh, an environmental and social impact assessment reports. We don't need to take permissions for installation uh, of of uh, say a wind farm, etc. Mm -hmm. And I think fundamentally, it presents a conflict in in uh, and and therefore. The role of the board, the investors who sit on the board, uh, and the investors who are financing uh, uh, a platform uh, that is focused on supplying renewable energy is is paramount uh, as a check and balance, right? So they should act as uh, the vigilance. They should be checking on on where things are and how things go. And and what I'm talking about, Anna, is exactly what happens uh, at Fourth Partner Energy, right? So we have our key financiers sitting on um, on our board, but of course down to our ESG committees. Uh, they work actively with our ESG team and with our project execution team to ensure that um, that we are adhering to uh, uh, to these checks and balances and to these standards that they expect uh, to see. Then comes the standards that they expect to see itself. Sorry, now that I touched upon it, and again, these are things that we are learning and evolving as we are rolling out, but it is also good to get a framework uh, that may uh, that they would have implemented across 
Uh, I think Ramchandra mentioned, uh, for example, in Europe, things that they are doing that they're trying to replicate here. And these are important aspects that, that can come across uh, on to us as a learning from, uh, for, from, from our investors on, uh, on, on what they are seeing as what we would classically call best practices across all of these markets. Um, bear in mind that renewable energy, uh, responsible renewable energy rollouts are actually, I think, uh, pretty much similar across the globe. I, you know, we are seeing that, you know, we in India are doing uh, things um, pretty much at par, if not better than some of what is happening globally for uh, the nuances that exist in this market, you know, for the extent of the population density we have, the complexity of land acquisition we have. Uh, in that context, we are doing a good job, but it's always good to know the standards that we can aspire to, uh, to, to be better on that front. Three, I think, look, um, uh, somewhere, I think uh, uh, we all need greater and better um, uh, intervention from the policymakers, uh, and and that's a, you know that's something that our that our investors uh, also take the lead on. For example, uh, you know when we talk foreign direct investment, when we are able to go in and speak with uh, the policymakers on the extent of capital commitment that they are they are making from the international markets into India. And then demand that some of these standards be adhering to what they want to see is uh, is is a much better conversation to have than um, you know than a standalone uh, policy rollout. Um, I think finally, um, and I, and I'll leave with the most important point, uh, isn't it that 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 you would expect from financiers? I think financiers have to provide capital, uh, and this capital should a um, uh, recognize uh, the value of responsible uh, rollout uh, in the in the platform, uh, incentivize it, uh, provide for uh, provide for um, for the platform and the people to learn through the process and improve. So be that in the form of grants, in the form of training sessions that allow for all of us to get our act uh, uh, even better and fine tuned. Uh, and, and finally, allow allow a platform uh, that sort of uh, highlights these kind of standards out to the industry to uh, to be well recognized and bring in more such uh, capital providers to, to the platform so that, um, you know, we as a developer uh, will feel incentivized that, of course, we want to do it because we care about the stakeholders and the community. But if there is a you know, uh, a complete commercial reason to do this as well, it works equally well aligned uh, from a financing point. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, the current lowest cost wins kind of paradigm in the industry has definitely been highlighted through the conversations as one of the big challenges actually for uh, for responsible energy, how you can afford to do some of the things we know we need to do to take the time we need to take to have the discussions we need to have. It's not an enabling environment right now. So that financing platform, it, it sounds like a very sensible uh, suggestion. Thank you. Uh, Radhakrishnan, can I come to you? Um, I think, you know, you are, as you mentioned, Axiona is a very well recognized uh, uh, business when it comes to your sustainability practice. Um, and you mentioned that it needs to be context specific. It was kind of something that Dr. Mathur brought up as well. Um, for you, what feels like the most substantial first step towards the vision from your position in the value chain here in India? What needs to come first? Thanks, Sana. The most difficult part to be in the panel is uh, to be the last speaker. <laughs> After the pandemic, to be physically present. Both are a big challenge. But, uh, so uh, three years before, we did not believe that we will be going around with a mask. Two years down the line, we did not believe that we'll be physically present in a hall, the sitting without any social distancing and talking. No? This is the kind of change and this is the power of us. So I think the power of us will be able to make us more responsible in um, producing renewable energy. Uh, we were always proud of saying that uh, we produce sustainable renewable energy. But now this new term responsible makes us uh, to be more proactive in order to achieve this term response because responsible is responsibility is always very difficult when we are in a group we say yes we can achieve but when we point somebody it becomes difficult to say yes i'm responsible to do the change so this is something which is uh, very good that we are starting this initiative we have been discussing this over the past uh, six seven months and also as dr mathu was mentioning we have also started to 
create the action plans under different areas, especially throughout the entire value chain uh, without neglecting any of them, right from uh, the human rights, the social and the environmental issues. Uh, sorry that I'm quoting a lot of Dr. Mathur and Shankar because I came 10 minutes late, so I was not able to listen to your uh, speech. Sorry for that. Uh, so when it comes to the next steps, uh, in globally, we have been uh, doing this uh, sustainability part where we are trying to be, uh, where we are more focused towards the production of energy. Uh, but sometimes uh, I'm just focusing on production of energy uh, just because that, that is where we have been focusing on, but now we are trying to bring it to the entire value chain. Uh, when it comes to the production of energy, the first step what we did is to improve the life cycle of the product. We all know that uh, both wind and solar we capitalize at 20 years. That is what the general saying goes. But we have already started to extend the life of the product to 30 years. So by extending it, we are creating more value to the system. And when it comes to this uh, particular area of responsible energy initiatives, we think that it should all start from us. It should start from our own house where we become more responsible. And that is where we have actually started with. We have completely jotted down the entire uh, value chain right from uh, acquisition of land, as uh, Vivek was uh, mentioning, till the end user, that is the utilities or the corporate clients. So we have uh, brought in uh, the entire thing in the value chain and we have made the vision statement. And based on this, we have already started working on the action plans. I think we have around 17 to 18 action plans which needs to be devised and uh, we have to implement them in the near uh, future. So that is the kind of challenge we face. But uh, I think with the kind of partnerships we have and the kind of commitments we have, we will be able to achieve them in the near future. Thanks. Brilliant. Thank you, Radha Krishnan. All right, brilliant. So thank you very much for those opening thoughts. Um, I have a question that's kind of, there's been a, a, a flow through some of the responses that I've heard um, about the role of policymakers and other decision makers and how, yes, it's really important to start with what's in your own control in your own house, but there's a feeling that there needs to be more of an enabling context for some of this stuff as well. Um, so I've already heard about how we'd like the policy making uh, uh, kind of sphere to be more in discussion with the industry uh, rather than kind of uh, bringing things out that are, are not based on the reality of the situation. And also the call for different frameworks. I'm just I'm keen to hear from you all. Like if there was one ask that you could make from the policy makers right now, what would it be? What do you need as different organizations in different places in this, this value chain uh, to make your uh, pathway towards more responsible energy easier? We've had significant developments happen where solar panels have now been named as part of the e-waste regulations. Um, what else do we actually need from policymakers? Um, so uh, Satish, would you like to go first? I can see her. I can see a thought brewing. Yeah, I should. Uh, thanks, uh, Anna. Uh, the second principle, uh, or the first principle, was we actively promote universal labor, land, and human rights. So the word universal is extremely important over here. And if there's one ask which we have to make for the renewable energy sector in this country, can we have a uniform regulatory framework for renewable energy across all the states in this country? We are not going beyond Indian borders to universalize it, but there has to be one regulatory framework. If state electricity being a kind of a joint subject between central government and state government, each state has come out with their own way of interpreting what the central government says and exit and at the ground level they can watch for it. There are significant challenges which exist uh, in terms of implementing those policies. So one simple thing that if you are talking about a universal harmonized laws kind of a thing, at least for renewable energy, can this country see and can states forget their differences and can come together because that's the kind of a number one priority for the country. Thank you, Satish. Uh, yeah, the commonality seems to be a common theme. Um, so. um, Red question, would you like to have <clears throat> Yeah, see, when it comes to the regulations, yes, as he said, that it is better to have a uh, uh, common regulation uh, within all the states so that it's much easier for us to implement uh, the the new uh, uh, plans. No, but uh, again, uh, we also wanted to see that when we are talking about 450 gigawatts in the near future, 
by 2030 are we prepared for that do we have the infrastructure for that is something which we need to continuously keep discussing but in this forum i, I think that in more uh, focusing on what we wanted to generate in the uh, by the coming years we have to see that how responsible we can be in producing that kind of an uh, infrastructure right uh, so uh, it is better that we have to come out with various uh, regulations guidelines and governance and so that we are causing minimum damage to the environment like uh, how do we take land on lease or is there any other way of taking land because by if you see when we are talking about 450 gigawatts when we are flying then we the complete landscape is going to be changed you can see only solar panels throughout india so we are going to change the entire landscape of the country you know so we have to be very uh, cautious about doing this and we have to see how can we achieve this with minimal exposure to the lands so that is one area where we have to work on and we also hope that we'll come out with very good regulations in order to for land acquisitions and so on thank you yeah coming from britain to hear a corporate asking for more regulation is is refreshing thank you uh, that's <laughs> very specific yeah. you know? it's all right i guess yeah. <laughs> thank you um vivek narayan would you like to add anything in terms of what you would like to see from your perspectives from policy making no, no, no. if you i'll go first uh, i think uh, satish covered the the importance of a of a uniform policy across india i I'd, I'd like to take this even even one level above and i think some of the biggest challenges when it comes to discussing um, a responsible rollout in renewable energy i i think we are doing as developers we are doing better on land than we did a few years back i think the practices on what needs to be done uh, for land acquisition are getting clearer uh, and 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 there i see synergy in our thinking versus what's happening on the ground because at the end of the day if you do that right up front uh, for the next 25 years that your plant is there you know you will not have uh, challenges so there is also a commercial uh, linkage there uh, when it comes to um, avenues of of dealing with ecological issues you know i think everybody uh, cares about um, uh, what needs to happen in the in the vicinity so long as we know the challenges like for example the giv problem that we know or aware of um, then we are able to take the recurring actions i think the one area that we are not completely in control of and 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 i'm just being uh, brutally honest here uh, is the uh, uh, is the module procurement or if you actually break it down it's also down to the policy on or cell level procurements that are coming through from china and i think the great, and the one thing that we can't do is we can't have conversations with china and that can only be done at a government to government level and i think if there is one thing i would leave um, uh, as as a request to the powers that are is basically if you can you know sort of step in and make sure that we can discuss between governments the importance of what we are seeking that is greater transparency uh, in where we are sourcing from in the uh, in the the work practices of where we are sourcing from i think we just can't wear blinkers and say uh, you know what we're going to have domestic manufacturing because that domestic manufacturing is going to take another 10 years before it really reaches a stage and state where we can feel comfortable as developers meanwhile uh you know we definitely need governments to speak uh about uh, about this challenge that exists at our end uh, and help us achieve what we want to achieve on that front mm. thank you very well said well said vivek narayan would you like to build on that no you know, i think if uh, all that uh, uh, my three co panelists have said if, if that is done that it makes the job of corporate buyers like us that much easier because you know there's one thing uh, to say that as a responsible uh, corporation we will assess uh, the suppliers uh, credentials on responsible energy on the other hand if there is a governing framework uh, from a regulatory perspective it makes things that much easier mm. right so Uh, I mean, we definitely welcome that. The one point that I wanted to call out um, when we talk about responsible energy, uh, when we talk about uh, clean energy, it's of course about uh, solar panels and windmills, but it's also about storage. It's about batteries, and that of course has a important role to play in companies' uh, uh, electric mobility programs, which again many companies are trying to progress fast on. We, for example, have a target of 100% electric mobility by 2030. 100% renewable energy and 100% electric mobility by 2030. Uh, 
and the global the supply chains for uh, storage batteries are global, right? And um, yeah, I mean, we're we are reading and hearing all all, all stories about uh, problems in sourcing basic commodities like lithium, and uh, the need to identify new sources in Latin America and other places. Mining is going to be an important part of that. So, so therefore, I think uh, the responsible procurement of uh, when, it, when you look at electric mobility's global supply chains as well, is going to be an important element that all of us as stakeholders need to look at. I'm just placing that on the table. Great, thank you, Naran. Yeah, I think I think the fact that the re renewable energy uh, industry actually is linked so closely to so many of these other important uh, evolving industries, I think, puts us in a position of influence, but also a position of challenge, given the kind of systemic nature of some of these uh, these issues. Um, I can see Ritu's joined us, so uh, welcome Ritu. Uh, we'll we'll be with you in a second, but I can see that Satish, you you have a point yeah. to make. Well. Come yeah, I, yeah, so I just thanks, uh, and I just want to add to what Narayan said. First of all, uh, well said again, uh, a small help from the organizations such as Wipro, Infosys, uh, which employs millions of people across the globe. Responsible procurement has been the focus uh, and which is the right focus for any organization. Now the time is how those organizations can assist in responsible recycling also. Mm. Today, what the country lacks is just a responsible recycling system where people are right from the whole household or the organization able to segregate a simple lithium ion battery before we disposing of X, Y, Z, or have organization which can do the same, and then it can be recycled. Now that small help will go a long way in terms of first minimizing the damage to the earth, containing the prices which we all suffer from on the lithium, and bringing in the whole culture of circularity which we desperately require. Yeah, that's a valid point, Satish. I completely agree. I think companies uh, uh, companies do a lot as as corporations when it comes to. Uh, uh, end of life, uh, uh, you know, recycling and so on. But I think at an individual level, uh, companies can do a lot in terms of advocacy with their employees, especially uh, employee intensive sectors like us. Right. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ritu, welcome. Uh, we can't see you on video. I'm wondering whether this is a connection issue. Uh, if you'd like to turn your video on, please do. Can you hear us OK? I think we'll, we'll hopefully we too will be with us in a moment. Um, but yeah, thank you. Um, brilliant. Uh, in a moment, I'm going to take a few questions, uh, both from online and uh, uh, from in the room. Um, so please do be ready with those. Um, I'm just going to ask, I guess, one more question, and I, I, I I'm going to come to each of you or give you each a, a, an opportunity to respond to this. We talked about kind of the country specific context and the responsible renewable energy initiative was devised as a multi country program. But the more and more we're getting into this, the more and more important that we're seeing that the country context is essential in making this happen. Um, so I'm just wondering from your perspectives uh, as players in the Indian renewable energy sector in particular, is there anything that is different or perhaps need to be more ac accelerated or more emphasized or less emphasized here in India than would be, say, in other contexts that we're seeing renewable energy uh, scale in. Um, I guess. Yeah, uh, so when, when it comes to technology, there is not much of a difference, no? except the 50 hertz and 60 hertz, which we use in different countries. More than that, we don't see major differences as far as the technology is concerned. So it is very easy for us to map whatever is happening in our, in our other countries or wherever we have our presence in those countries to adopt to those technologies. Mm -hmm. And mainly we operate with single R&D center in one place and we try to work for different uh, countries. Uh, so the, the technology transfer is not a problem when it comes to, but when there are other social issues uh, like uh, or soft issues, like when it comes to uh, the land, the regulatories and so on, these are all the areas which becomes more uh, country specific and uh, this is where we wanted to have the regulations which tries to make us more binding towards these kind of uh, and actually if you see the uh, like many of our panelists were discussing that 
uh, when it comes to all these uh, recycling and this, these are all things which has to start. Uh, in, in, for example, the lithium batteries which we use in the home, we don't have a proper regulation to how do we dispose. So if there is a solution for that, then we have a solution on a bigger scale or on the utility scale. So uh, I want to just leave it there for the other panelists to discuss on this. Thank you. Um, Satish, Vivek, Narayan, is there anything that you feel is specific to, to India or potentially more more I'd like to, yes, I'd like to say that uh, instead of saying anything specific to India, I'd like to say what is missing probably in India uh, will help to really provide some more acceleration to the vision of the government uh, of the 500 gigawatt renewable energy capacity. And that is basically a higher uh, emphasis and incentive for higher efficiency panels. Uh, globally, be it China, be it US or Europe, uh, Governments after governments are coming forward to ensure that by incentivizing a higher efficiency panels, you are able to conserve the land, you are able to minimize the space, and which is precious in some manner. Uh, in our context, currently where we are at a stage, uh, we go for a higher ACDC ratio uh, to get the same number of units rather than thinking to deploy a tracker in the European and other context virtually 80% plus people deploy a tracker. We don't do that in India because additional capital expenditure and it works out to be when the panels were cheaper, uh, getting a higher ACDC ratio was much, much easier. Now the panels are costlier. Hopefully we'll see a kind of a greater uptake of trackers in this country. But that focus on higher efficiency helps to really the cause of resource efficiency in all manners, be it land, water, anything which we are using in these farms. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Satish, uh, I have a point to add on this when it comes to the trackers. So that is where we say that the regulations needs to be very specific. No? Uh, for example, if there is a rider that you cannot cross so many acres per megawatt. Now we have the liberty of using the ACDC ratio 20 and we are able to see that when the costs were minimal, we did not have that kind of a regulation. But as you said, yes, we have to look into those directions where because if you see 450 gigawatts is somewhere around uh, 10 lakh football fields, no, it is the size of that is the size of uh, land we will be requiring at in order to implement. So, regulations on this also might help. Now, right now, we can see that is coming up in the part of Karnataka where we heard that the new regulation talks about uh, one megawatt uh, for one megawatt we cannot go or around four acres of land per WTG is what uh, the regulation which is going to come in with. So, I don't know how how practical that is going to be, but I think the already the discussions are on and people are trying to bring in those regulations. Yeah. yeah. And I'd like to go to your, uh, the question that you asked and put it in context to just to share with how we uh, at Fourth Partner Energy are looking at this. We play across the region, Anna, not just in India, we're also in, in our neighboring South Asia and Southeast Asian markets. Um, so I think if you take a step back, India is sort of uh, very well uh, I think the Indian position, uh, uh, policy-wise, uh, vision and scale-wise, uh, and cost of renewable energy competitiveness-wise, I think what we've achieved here is um, uh, is really exemplary and very much sought after uh, by a lot of our customers across in the neighboring markets, right? So they look at India with envy, with awe, uh, and, and definitely as a much credible alternative to learn from uh, than a relatively uh, closed market of China, much larger but relatively closed market of, um, of China. Uh, where we couldn't stand up uh, in terms of support is our potential to supply components from India to these neighboring markets. Uh, we've not built that kind of capability, but I'm sure that uh, we will have that also in a few years. But I think what India has got right uh, in all of these aspects, which is policy uh, to a large extent, policy, um, uh, vision, uh, cost competitiveness, and I'll add one more aspect, which is very critical, I think, to India's success, which is the, um, which is a, a confluence of very good ESG financiers, right? So all kinds of financing uh, that that have come on board in this capital market, in this market, um, which are all strengths um, that we are taking to our neighboring markets at Footpart Energy, we're doing just this and seeing the value of. Um, I think if to it, we can add the fact that we are also um, uh, a leading think tank uh, and an executor of responsible renewable energy rollout, 
I think we would be, we could become another very, this could become a very strong competitive advantage, especially, again, I put it in context to, especially in comparison uh, uh, to our friends in China, where information is generally seen to be um, a little bit more opaque. And therefore, India could stand out uh, on this additional avenue as well and, and, and use that uh, to formulate uh, uh, expansion into these potentially uh, large markets that in our vicinity uh, that are seeking our assistance on this front. So I'll leave that thought behind. Thank you, Vivek. Uh, Narayan, would you like to add anything? And then I'll, I'll come to Richie. Uh, the only thing I want to add is that, yes, I agree. And India has been very progressive on, uh, you know, on different aspects of clean energy and uh, clean mobility. Uh, given the fact that we have a fairly vibrant uh, civil society ecosystem, um, the the issues of uh, which are which are community centric, you know, land use change, human rights, and so on, uh, as pertaining to re uh, renewable energy and as pertaining to uh, more, uh, electric mobility and so on, I think uh, the uh, civil society sector has not yet paid attention to this. So I think it would be important to sort of to get them on board and look at it and work along with the other key players in the space. So of course, government, as we all said a little earlier, has a role to play in terms of uh, certain regulatory tweaks and changes. Uh, investors, suppliers, and, uh, and uh, buyers uh, uh, have certain roles that are clearly well-defined. And then you need civil society uh, organizations that work with communities to see how to get all this you know, going in a way that uh, is aligned with the overarching uh, direction that we want to go in, right? So it it will not help anybody if uh, different players pull in different directions. So it has to be aligned, and that's really the challenge. Thank you, Narayan. Um, Ritu, can you hear us now? Oh, I can imagine. You can just imagine the frustration if she can hear. Ah. Uh, but we can't hear her. OK, I'm sorry about this, Ritu. <laughs> um, all right, so I would like to open it up to questions from the audience, both online and uh, and here in person. We've had one online that was about when can we expect the hydrogen standard to be implemented. Now, some of us in the consortium ex are experts in foresight, but I think even we don't know the answer to that one. Um, but I would like to say that I think this drive for hydrogen is going to make this agenda even more important just because we can't have hydrogen that is gray or blue it needs to be green, green. Um, and without renewable energy and without responsible energy then that hydrogen is going to suffer the same issues um, so does anybody in the room have a question that you'd like to pose to our esteemed colleagues on the panel or to the team here that's involved in responsible energy initiative There's two, I can see. Brilliant. Okay. Shall we go? Oh, the mic's coming to you first, and then we'll come over to you. Thank you. If you'd like to introduce yourselves, and then. Yeah. Uh, my name is Manvi. I'm advisor, program advisor for Social Ecological Transformation Workline at the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung. It's a German think tank a foundation. And um, we are also very um, actively working on just energy transition. Uh, in India and in the region or globally as well. Um, you might come across a lot of programs by FES uh, in this regard. I just want to make two quick points and then I'll come to the question. Uh, one is uh, I'm an urbanist uh, as well. I'm an urban planner. And uh, thank you so much, Mr. Radhakrishnan, for putting in the point about, you know, how the landscape of the country is going to change when there is a lot of, you know, there's uh, like acres and acres of um, installation of renewable energy. I mean, I am a strong advocate of unbuilding in the present uh, scenario because uh, because if the ultimate objective is climate justice and climate change, then we need to build less and basically use the infrastructure which is available. I just hope that the companies who are working uh, for RE Solutions also take cognizance of these opportunities and you know are not really into building more on the ground. We need the ground uh, for green covers and for um recharging um the second point is that at fes also when we talk about just energy transition there are two very strong points one is of um, 
uh, economic justice or economic rights uh, and the second is of gender justice uh, and we have seen that whenever we are also uh, you know talking about uh, just energy uh, transition narrative and when we want a you know a positive buy in from say the uh, people who have the economic capital or the economic power uh, then it makes a lot of sense when you approach it from a livelihood perspective because for instance in the coal sector i mean the coal worker would not be really interested in how the you know the country is moving towards a renewable energy target but more about what happens to its life yeah. also because a lot of them are still uh, for their daily uh, you know household needs dependent on coal so you know the coal is really important to them so i think uh, when it is approached from a livelihoods perspective and economic justice perspective it makes most it makes most sense uh, to bring those actors into the fold uh, and thirdly uh, the question which i would really like to know from uh, uh, the companies who are present here because i think they can uh, you know they have uh, the opportunity to set right examples in this regard is that women we know in renewable energy are few and far and uh, we need we need their economic empowerment we need uh, to bring them as well in the uh, energy transition because for various needs and reasons known to all of us they will be uh, one of the biggest losers in the uh, transition uh, just want to know if you your companies have a policy towards you know uh advancing women's uh, economic and uh, climate justice rights uh in the RE sector brilliant thank you that's a great question um so we'll take that first and then I'll come to you if that's all right um uh Vivek I wonder whether you might want to share some of the examples that I'm pretty sure you've been involved in and I know this is frustrating because Ritu has a brilliant example of this um, which I might try and paraphrase if we can't get her on the on the microphone but Vivek you may know as well so can I invite you to share some and then I'll invite you. Okay. Anna, uh, and if you don't mind, can you repeat the question just so that I'm clear which part I'm answering? Sorry. <laughs> yeah, sure. No, there were some great points made in there. So the question was, uh, could you share a little bit about how you are ensuring gender justice and economic justice through the work that you're doing, getting women in, women into the, the value chain itself, but also helping with broader livelihoods and uh, Kind of addressing some of the power dynamics and uh, equity issues that we're facing when it comes to women yeah so i wish we can do so much more uh, i think we'll have to start at a country policy level there are so much that we need fixing there uh, but at, at at a company level we are also constrained by the options that are available in the market um, from our end we've done all the basics right so we have um, you know uh, from the recruitment plan uh, to the recruitment team, down to the management committees, and straight through to the CEO, we have incentives built to increase the participation of women. Uh, I mean, so we've tried to make it as black and white uh, to make sure we are all focused on that. We see value in that uh, exercise. It's just not a uh, it's not a marketing tool. It is a genuinely impactful tool in in functions that we have. And take just the function we are talking about, right? ESG. I think. Uh, the uh, the general consensus across the board uh, is, uh, at least from our recruitment team as well as our ESG team, is that just by bringing in uh, women in this function, uh, we will all be uh, that we will all make our uh, performance on our targets uh, on how we are ensuring just transition. Uh, we will be far more sincere and honest about it uh, than than we would if we were just running a spreadsheet. Um, in our case, we also have to deal with uh, the challenges from a rollout and uh, on the site perspective. And I, I just want to highlight that aspect as well, where we're dealing with communities, what we can do uh, for women in these communities. Uh, we've tried to always ensure that, uh, in, in, I mean, no rocket science, but just by engaging with the women around in the community, you get greater buy-in and commitment uh, from the community for support. Um, in auxiliary services, like, you know, for example, we use some of their services for uh, basic plant cleaning, et cetera, for, for what we uh, what we anyway require that. Uh, and here, um, uh, or in getting good ideas on what else we can do from a social impact perspective, uh, in our plant in UP, we got great insights from the local team on what we, on what help they, um, um, the women thought uh, we should be uh, providing for. Uh, accordingly, we worked on a project that uh, or we are working on a project that uh, that that is just doing uh, doing just that. This is, uh, for example, there was a small pond 
women were finding it extremely challenging that the water there was not clean enough. Uh, they highlighted health issues that they are sensing in the families. Um, we have therefore started uh, to prioritize on that first uh, before we got anywhere else uh, in terms of the work that we are doing in those um, uh, with the communities in the vicinity. Um, I think I'll leave one small point uh, uh, on this front uh, also out there, I think. Um, the greater challenge for us has also been how we in, how we bring in women into the leadership uh, roles as well. You know, not just participation of women. We are talking about women making key calls and decisions in in our organization uh, as well. You know, so uh, we have an executive committee. We have um, my colleague Jignasa who sits there, plays a very important role in terms of our fundraise renewal capital team. Um, uh, for us making sure that uh, that um, uh, that we have greater participation of women in the senior leadership is another yeah. measure that we have put up uh, against. It's just not about overall women in the workforce. Uh, I think we've tried to address this a little differently uh, as well. Uh, as you said, I hope Ritu can still speak, but we are also very closely monitored uh, by our, our board on all of these parameters. And That's great. <laughs> I think the, the governance aspect is important there. Um, I think if Ritu had been here, she would have shared a story where they had invested in a particular initiative to really drive uh, skill building in women around one particular very large site. Uh, and they had a brilliant amount of participation in the actual program to, to build the skills from, from women. And they'd done a lot of work uh, in the community building the, the kind of buy-in for sending these women on these courses. And then when push came to shove, when the jobs were, when they came out the other side of these courses, very well qualified, the women didn't take the jobs. And so there are so many different structural societal issues that we as a sector and other sectors face when it comes to not just providing the skills, but actually ensuring that people can take these opportunities up. There are, you know, there are societal societal acceptability issues, there are uh, issues of safety, there are many uh, barriers I think that we face and I think yeah maybe we should get you and Ritu in conversation to share some of the kind of deeper more more uh, insightful uh, issues around that particular initiative that they need to be scaled and we need to join hands with other value chains to make that happen. Um, I'm conscious of time. Uh, we have approximately three minutes left, but I would like to take that lady's question there and any questions that are remaining, perhaps we could talk about them over tea afterwards. I'm very sorry, but if I could take, uh, could we get the mic to, to the lady in the grey cardigan? If you'd like to just introduce yourself and just, yeah. Uh, my name is Sushmita Saha. I'm from the nonprofit Common Cause. Uh, a significant uh, part of our work is on the environment. Uh, so uh, uh, this is a kind of a curiosity after, you know, uh, 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 after uh, reading through reams of literature and kind of participating in debates on responsible renewable energy, this kind of curiosity uh, is, is in inevitable, I think. I wanted to ask that these sectors, the renewable energy sectors are sectors of immense scale. We are talking about billions of people in large tracts of land across the the globe and India commendably has done better than a lot of countries in this sector. So congratulations on a fabulous transition and uh, building up of capabilities uh, in this sector. So that is wonderful. But at the same time, uh, you know, uh, a, a, a significant uh, portion of our energy mix is still fossil fuels, uh, close to a gigantic 80%. So uh, I was just wondering, and this is a question to all the stakeholders present here, is, is the, uh, you know, uh, 2030 COP26 goals that we have and the kind of renewable energy mix that we are planning to achieve, is it a realistic one and where are we on that roadmap? Well, that's a, Thank you. That's a neat one to end on. So perhaps this is the last uh, question I can pose to you guys. Um, yeah, how how optimistic are you? I guess is the question, and and yeah, what's your hope for? So, uh, thanks for the question. I was just wondering why this question has not come up so far. Huh? Uh, this is uh yeah, this is the you you rightly said it is it the target is uh, quite high. It is uh, it is an Himalayan target if you say the Indian the Indian context of it. Uh, it 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 requires a lot of push. Uh, 
though it might not be a very uh, what do you call an achievable target at this point of time but the way the technology is building up especially the alternatives which has come up like uh, storage and nitrogen so this uh, the, the the more important of these these can be decentralized no when it comes to hydrogen and batteries it can be decentralized so we can uh, we we need not much depend upon the grid infrastructure which comes up it can be uh, very specific to the place where it is required we can give around the clock power and so on so with these alternatives it becomes much easier i am not saying that the entire target is going to be easy but we have found out alternatives which can help us in uh, achieving those uh, targets but when you ask about optimism it's again a big question which is still lingering but it's always uh, good to have a uh, target which is very high and our entire workforce to work on it rather than having a minimal target and boosting that we have achieved always right yes wish to the stars you at least get to the moon right um, and can i take that response as well sorry i'll just add two more points on yeah, this yeah. Go for it. I, I think first point is that um, uh, it's a. I mean, as 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 Ramchandra rightly highlighted, it's a humongous target. It needs it needs some structural changes. Some of uh, which uh, are are not happening as fast as they should. Um, uh, I think one of the points. I'm sorry, I missed. I couldn't hear fully. But one of the ladies mentioned is that you know, are we going to achieve this entire rollout by just simply building large utility scale projects, or are we going to look at distributed energy? in the form that we ideally should. So where is rooftop solar in the entire scheme of things? Uh, from a government policy perspective, it's, it's just not good enough. We need mm -hmm. to do a lot more there if we can achieve. So it's not just about achieving the absolute numbers uh, as this forum is rightly talking about. It is about the quality of that as well. You know, is it is it just that, uh, that transition that we are trying to achieve? And there we definitely need to think about the mix and how we can make an impact from a policy perspective to ensure that the mix is equally um, uh, equally attractive as we are making that migration towards 2030. Because when we are giving renewable energy goals, in effect, we are translating it in some form and shape to carbon footprint. And, uh, and I think there will be a better translation by focusing on the quality uh, of that mix. So that's point one. I just want to highlight one more point. We, unfortunately, um, uh, in our... Uh, you know, we are frogs in our well, and you know, in the well that we see, which is corporate India, um, uh, I think those numbers are definitely achievable. Corporates today are talking about uh, wanting to be 100% renewable energy by as early as 2025, uh, and I think if uh, you know the corporates are taking a great lead on this front, are ensuring that renewable energy might, um, uh, at least at their end, the migration is going to be quicker than the 2030 timeframes. Uh, and and their sustainability targets are um, are being measured by the board. So this is not just some you know number thrown in the air that they are not going to adhere to. Uh, we are quite excited to see what's happening on that front. Whether that translates to India achieving those numbers, and more importantly, uh, all our neighboring countries and uh, and all the other countries in the world uh, achieving the targets that they are set to COP26 is a very tough question to answer as early as 2020. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I am conscious of time, but I would love to hear from Satish and Narayan just one final word on, yeah, how optimistic do you feel? <laughs> and, and then we'll uh, get to tea for the people. Satish. So I'll be short. Uh, it's not about <laughs> optimism. Uh, there is no alternative we have. Uh, that's the way I like to look at it. Uh, the country has to have a resolve. And uh, instead of debating whether it will be achievable or not achievable, uh, the time needs to be put on how to achieve it. This cannot be achieved unless it is people's movement. It cannot be a government A or a COP26 organization's target as such. Uh, each organization, government and the individual has to really work towards making it happen. And I don't see any reason that why it won't happen if all the forces are aligned to make it happen because it's not an unsurmountable target. Thank you, Satish. Narayan. No, like to add, you know, uh, I, as uh, Vivek said, I think from a corporate perspective, um, we don't see uh, problems or too many serious problems or challenges, especially when it comes to renewable <laughs> energy. From a technology perspective, I think uh, there may be a, a, a few um, tough nuts to crack, like storage, as we know, but we know that we're going to get there. 
Uh, from a technology perspective, I think we are fairly optimistic. I think the people aspect, which is what Responsible Energy is trying to focus on, uh, that's that's the that's the challenge that we've spoken about for the last one hour that we'd have to really work hard on. Okay. Uh, but I think what I heard the questioner also talk about, given that large footprint of fossil fuel energy uh, in the country, is that what is the right pace of this transition in a manner that is also just from all angles? You know, uh, stranded assets in the fossil fuel industry, lost jobs in the fossil fuel industry. So, uh, you know, what is the right pace of transition? I don't have an answer to that. I just think that it's an important angle, though, to this whole discussion. Absolutely. Thank you. Um Ritu, I know you're there and I know that you've been really keen to join the panel and I'm so sorry, but because of technical issues on your laptop, you haven't been able to. I might put you in touch with a few people who have uh, questions I think that uh, you would be able to share really valuable insights for. So apologies for the technical issues and um, yeah, just want to acknowledge how kind Ritu has been in supporting our initiative uh, so far. So yeah, so thank you all uh, to our brilliant esteemed colleagues on this panel. Thank you for the great questions. And I think just leaving on that thought of this needs to be an urgent transition, but it needs to be an urgent transition that is just and of high quality and delivering the value that Sachin was talking about earlier on. So thank you so much, Vivek, Satish, Narayan, Ritu. Thank you thank so you. much for being here in thank person you. in Prussia. Thank you. Um, and I'll hand over now to Shirish just to give a vote of thanks. Um, thank you, everyone. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I think we had a very interesting session since morning and I'm, I'll am i try to summarize a little bit and take five, ten minutes of yours, although I know it is running, we are running late on time. Uh, uh, we started with an excellent uh, welcome at, uh, you know, um, uh, addressed by Mr. Ajay Shankar and, uh, and he brought out a very important point that transition has been happening there you know since you know we had industrial uh, revolution and then uh, you know in within the industrial uh, uh, societies there were transitions happening from uh, production perspective from industry transformation perspective but where these transitions really just where these transitions were really fair to the societies I think that is the question uh, we uh, we can look into the history, but we can learn from that history and uh, see that the transition which is we are we are heading as a res, uh, res, as a renewable energy industry is responsible is just uh, both from society perspective and also from uh, ecological uh, perspective and nat nature's perspective. I think that is one of the important uh, message we got from his uh, lecture. So thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, I mean, Ajay Shankarji, of course, he's not here now. Uh, we had also equally important message uh, from Dr. Ajay Mathur's uh, keynote address that when we are talking of responsible energy initiatives and uh, the action plans, A, we need to have some good action plans and B, they need to be country specific or society specific or at least regional specific. They can't be one shoe fitting all. And I think that is one of an important uh, message uh, we got from uh, his uh, lecture. Of course, there are, uh, I mean, uh, there are issues uh, with respect to renewables, with respect to regulatory or policy um, uh, environment, which uh, we discussed in detail. I thank all the speakers uh, for coming out with, uh, uh, you know, good po points to uh, for the discussion. 
how they 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 are taking the initiative what is their optimism uh, optimistic view on the uh, re uh, renewables going forward etc and uh, so thanks all the speakers sir uh, especially uh, mr ramchandran for being present here and also others uh, who uh, may spared their valuable time to be with us and to guide us uh, i think the discussions were very uh, focused a uh, very uh, positive and i think there is a lot uh, as a team uh, we can take forward i take uh, this opportunity to thank all the uh, partners and also uh, thank the funders for uh, uh, responsible Renew uh, renewables initiative uh, the british government the snp funds uh, macarthur foundation and uh, the scd fund <clears throat> uh, I thank all the uh, media persons and our communication teams uh, from uh, all the partners uh, uh, for making this uh, event more interactive and uh, taking it to to the society. <laughs> uh last but not least i thank the organizers the uh, my uh, team from terry's uh, uh, event management and communications uh, for uh, co putting for putting uh, this uh, you know event uh, in a very short period of time we are hardly 15 days or so uh, to put this and uh, of course a big thanks to anna and saksham for coordinating it extremely well so uh, thank you all and uh, i invite you all uh, who are present here of course uh, to join us for a high tea thank you very much Thank <laughs> you.